from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs uh, and the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon uh, for a lecture by a distinguished historian, Professor John Darwin, who will be talking about decolonization, a history of failure. Very provocative title. Uh, the lecture is offered in conjunction with the current four-week seminar on decolonization, uh, which is a joint project with the National History Center and the John W. Kluge Center uh, Library of Congress with funding by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Before we begin, if you would, um, if you have a cell phone, would you please turn it off or other electrical equipment that might interfere with the recording? So much of the world that we are living in today bears the footprints of um, the process of decolonization in the years after World War II. Um, and exploring that process and its implications um, has been the subject of an ongoing seminar. Uh, this is the sixth year of that, uh, that the library has hosted and that the National History Center has organized. And I want to say a word about um, each organization and the wonderful collaboration. Uh, the National History Center promotes research, teaching, and learning in all fields of history. It was created by the American Historical Association in 2002 as a public trust dedicated to the study and teaching of history, as well as to the advancement of historical knowledge in government, business, and the public at large. Uh, needless to say, they have a wonderful web page. You can go to that to learn more www.nationalhistorycenter.org. Um, the John W. Kluge Center at the library um, is really happy with this collaboration with the National History Center um, and earlier before it was formed with the American Historical Association um, as a way of bringing uh, researchers, because we're interested in bringing researchers to the library to mine the depths of the collections. And of course, historians actually um, are the uh, largest number and deepest users of the library's collections. The Kluge Center was established in 2000 uh, by a generous donation from John W. Kluge to provide opportunities for the world's finest scholars uh, to have informal conversations with members of Congress. It doesn't happen frequently, but when it does, it can be quite wonderful. Uh, so we try to bring together the world of affairs and the world of ideas. Um, the community of senior scholars is joined by a rich collection of the world's most promising junior scholars and together form a really wonderful intellectual community. Um, as part of that, we offer lectures such as this, seminars such as the National History uh, Centers um, and other such programs. You can find out more about the center and also sign up for um, email notification by going to our webpage on the Library of Congress homepage, right-hand side, you'll find the Kluge Center um, page, and there at the bottom, you can sign up for email notification. Um, today's lecture, uh, will, lecture will be introduced by Professor Roger Lewis, uh, the Kerr Chair in, in English History and Culture, and Distinguished Teaching Professor at the University of Texas in Austin well-known and admired for his work on the British Empire, especially post-World War II, uh, that period of decolonization. Um, he has written and edited more than 30 books on the subject um, and is the guiding spirit both behind the National History Center's formation um, and also behind the seminar which he conceived, funded, um, and now leads each year. Um, in the process, he really has been able to establish decolonization as a new field within the history profession. Uh, we at the library also are very proud to claim Professor Lewis 
um, as a, he was a, a Kluge Senior Chair, Kluge Chair for Country and Cultures of the North in 2010. Um, and he is a member of the Library Scholars Council, a group of distinguished scholars who advise the librarian on various issues. So please welcome Dr. Lewis, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Carolyn. I want to acknowledge uh, the help, the assistance that we have received for many years from Carolyn Brown, from the Kluge Center, and the Library of Congress. Uh, indispensable uh, assistance in helping to run the seminar on decolonization. We are now in our uh, sixth year of the seminar, uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge also the presence of the 15 uh, seminarians. Uh, we are now in the third day of getting the seminar up and going. And we are especially pleased that John Darwin is giving the inaugural lecture to the seminar uh, because he is going to challenge uh, the very premise on which the seminar usually uh, operates. Uh, John Darwin is going to ask whether uh, this was such a good idea after all, or at least the assumption that the, uh, old, the dissolution of the old European empires resulting in the world of nations as we know it today, symbolized by some 50 nations uh, that represented the United Nations at its founding in 1945 to some 200 uh, nations today, uh, this is usually regarded as a, um, a success story. In other words, the replacement of the old system of colonies with a family of nations. Uh, John Darwin, uh, according to the blurb that has been posted in the uh, Washington Post, uh, wants to challenge this question by asking whether this detritus of the broken down empires uh, is a success story after all. Uh, for that matter, is the world of nations uh, even uh, a desirable solution? Uh, this would lead on to me to suggest that anarchy might be a favorable uh, solution to what we now have, but I leave this up to uh, John Darwin actually to uh, argue the case. Uh, what I would like to say about John uh, is that he brings considerable authority to the subject, having published uh, several works that have been truly significant in the historiography, including one on Egypt uh, and the empire, including another book on decolonization itself. But people uh, kept wondering, when is John Darwin uh, going to publish his great work? Uh, and this took quite a long time. Uh, and one reason for this uh, is that he's from Oxford. Uh, so there's no reason to be any any particular hurry about this. Uh, but when he did, uh, he managed to confuse everyone uh, because he published first a book on the international economy entitled After Tamerlane, The Global History of Empire in 2007 before he published his life work on the history of the British Empire, which is called The Empire Project, The Rise and Fall of the British World System, uh, which was published two years later in 2009. And people are still trying to make up their minds about which book is which and how they stand in relation to uh, one another. Uh, there is one remarkable uh, part of John Darwin's career that I thought I might mention, and that is that almost uh, the entirety of it is, has been spent in Oxford and at Nuffield College. And one might ask the reason for this. I mean, one could say, give us a break. Why don't you spend a year at Harvard, uh, perhaps even Cambridge? Uh, the reason for this is a very Nuffield reason, uh, that if you happen to be at Nuffield, 
uh, you're at the very top of the world. Uh, there is no reason to go anywhere else or to do anything else except to remain uh, at uh, Nuffield. I have to say, though, that this is not a universal view. Uh, the former Regis professor at Oxford uh, referred to Nuffield College as the Tibet of Oxford. Uh, so what I suggest that we are going to hear this afternoon is a view from the point of view of Tibet, of the Oxford, uh, of the British Empire. Uh, this will be most interesting, a Tibetan view of the British decolonization. John Darwin. Thank you very much. I think somebody has walked off with one of my pages, Roger. <laughs> I think if I had known the terms of Roger's uh, introduction to me, I, uh, of me, I would have uh, worn a rather different set of clothes. As it is, of course, um, I must begin by expressing very warm thanks to, first of all, the National History Centre for allowing me to take part in this uh, enormously successful seminar on decolonization, which, as Roger said, has been running now for six years, and also to the Kluge Centre, and especially Carolyn Brown, for giving me such a warm welcome and providing me with the ideal circumstances in which to do some work. Of course, I have now to do some work in order to justify these excellent conditions. <clears throat> Let me begin also with um, two apologies. One is for my bedraggled appearance this afternoon. Perhaps like other people here, I decided to take a long, hard, cool shower on my way to the Library of Congress this afternoon. And the other apology is um, when I glance around the room and see people looking rather glazed, I shall attribute it, of course, to my strange foreign accent. <clears throat> I don't say that lightly. Some years ago, I found myself on the Golan Heights with a party of other academics, which included Russians, Italians, Germans, Spaniards, Hungarians, French. And when we went to see the colonel, he said, ask your questions. So everybody did in Russian English, Italian English, French English, Hungarian English, etc. Then it was my turn, and I asked my question. And the colonel said, speak more clearly. I don't understand your English. <laughs> so I had to explain that I came, I was afraid, from a rather remote corner of the English-speaking world, between Scotland and France, but I would do my best. <clears throat> <laughs> now, let me turn then to the subject. And I'm not sure I'm quite going to meet all Roger's uh, expectations in terms of the challenges I'm going to throw out. But it is true, of course, as he said, that decolonization is regarded, and perhaps rightly regarded, as one of the foundational processes in the making of the modern world. The shift from a world order dominated by great empires to what is usually described, or has been described, as a world of nations. Indeed, it's hard to imagine our modern world without that great transition having taken place from some 50 states in 1945, 50 sovereign states in 1945, to around 200 today. And of course, the, this uh, uh, foundational characteristic of this process has encouraged a kind of what you might call Whig history, in which the process has been seen not only as a great success, but as providential, inevitable, and progressive. Indeed, almost a kind of end of history in itself. And not surprisingly, given that there's wide agreement on its virtues. A long queue of people has formed to take credit for it, as usually happens. As they say, victory has many fathers, defeat is an orphan, and this seemed to be a great victory. But the historian's job is not to act as a kind of praise singer or courtier to great processes admired by powerful people, but to ask, as far as he or she can, fairly pressing questions. And in this case, perhaps there are four we might want to think about. One is, what vision was it which inspired what turned out to be a very particular conception 
of the ideal world order, the world of nations. What inspired that? Secondly, how was that vision actually implemented in practice by those in whose power it was to transform the world in this fashion? And that's, of course, not just one or two sets of people. Thirdly, what were the consequences of creating so many new states so rapidly in the course of some 20 or 25 years after 1945? And lastly, what happened when decolonization collided with that other foundational process of our modern world, globalization? Now, it's important before I go any further to say what I'm not arguing, and I do that with particular anxiety because Roger didn't mention this, but tomorrow uh, the seminar will be discussing, and I dare say dissecting with very sharp scalpels what I said this evening. And I will need to be in a good position to defend what you may think are some of the more outrageous statements that I might make. What I'm not saying is that empire was a good thing. Of course, it's a debate about how bad empire was, but that's a debate perhaps for another day. It's perhaps not entirely a profitable debate, and it depends upon an extremely complex calculus. But I'm not arguing that. Secondly, I'm not arguing that decolonization could or should have been delayed or prevented. To try and make such an argument would be a form of second guessing of the actors of the time, which historians are quite fond of, but historians aren't necessarily the best people to second guess what are done by political actors. If there's one thing that might be worse than being governed by politicians, it would probably be to be governed by historians. Thirdly, I'm not arguing that decolonization has not been profoundly liberating intellectually and also morally. One of the major changes which the political act of decolonization produced and certainly reinforced was, of course, the end of respectability of racism as an understanding of the cultures of the world. That change of attitude followed rather than preceded the political changes of decolonization. And of course, anybody who's an historian is extremely aware of the transformative impact on the study of history itself, which, de which decolonization has brought. A remarkable democratization in many ways of its concerns, an opening up to many different constituencies, groups of people, of the opportunity to assert their place in the world to discover or rediscover their identity. But what I am arguing is that decolonization was not, of course, either a smooth or inevitable process, especially in the way it actually happened. And here the question of failure, perhaps, is rather more pertinent. There is a case to answer, I think. And let me suggest to you five points around which one might structure such an argument. Consider firstly how often it was there was no smooth transfer of power from colonial rule, but often a bitter war of succession. Think of the case, cases of Korea or of Indochina, or indeed on a grand, grander scale within the Middle East, or in South Central Africa, where the end of colonial rule was an exceptionally ragged, disorganized, and violent affair whether in Angola, in Mozambique, in what is now Zimbabwe, and of course in the Congo. Think secondly of the extreme violence which accompanied the later stages of the transition from colonialism to decolonization, especially in India, of course, in Algeria, in Kenya, in Cyprus, again, of course, in Portuguese Angola and Mozambique. Although, of course, this was only partly a struggle between the colonial power and those who organized themselves against it. Think thirdly of the failures of institutional transfer, which were understood to be a key element in decolonization, the passing over from the colonial power to the decolonized state of its institutions, especially its institutions of representative government, the rule of law, etc. Here, India stands out as a great exception, 
perhaps the great exception that proves the rule elsewhere, where varieties of one-party rule, military dictatorship, often seem to be the in almost inevitable outcome after a short period of transition. Fourthly, think of the failures of nation building. That's to say the failure to cultivate or build an adequate sense of a shared national identity in so many of the new sovereign states that covered the globe, covered the map after 1947, but particularly perhaps after about 1960. And think third, the fifthly, I beg your pardon, think fifthly of the failures of both of economic and cultural integration, which inevitably seem to have accompanied the spatchcocking together of territories once ruled by the colonial uh, powers into sovereign states. The question we might well ask is, why was decolonization such a messy process? Now, part of the answer, I would suggest, is that there was a profound failure on the part of, especially those who, in whose power it lay to accelerate this process, to really imagine the consequences of winding up empire. Now, perhaps this profound failure is, uh, is not surprising, nor reprehensible. Human affairs seem to be constantly afflicted by failures of foresight. It's part, perhaps, of the human condition. But it's interesting, I think, to ask why this sort of happened. And I think the answer lies in two enormously powerful, pervasive, and influential assumptions, which had really fused by the early post-World War II years. The first is that empires were a great aberration in world history. They were a peculiarity. They were abnormal. And because they were abnormal, they could be brought to an end in a way which actually advanced the health, as it were, of society, the society, international society at large. And secondly, an assumption that the natural state of the world was one in which units with fixed boundaries could cooperate harmoniously. This was, you might say, the fundamental idea behind the world of nations. Now, why this view became so influential is in some ways rather puzzling. It represents perhaps a kind of fusion of Marxism and nationalism as intellectual influences. Two gods of the 20th century, which you might say conspicuously failed. Now, in fact, of course, if one does cast one's eye over world history without the spectacles of nationalism and Marxism clenched on one's face, what's striking is that over the long view of world history, empire has been the default mode of political organization for almost all the time. And that's not, in fact, a very surprising statement to make. And by contrast, nation states, i.e. states that were able to fit their territory closely to a sense of ethnic identity and cultural unity were extremely rare, partly because, of course, of the sheer difficulty of constructing such states. The 20th century has been the great exception to that long history of the world. And of course, that change, that exceptionality of the 20th century has a great deal to do with a very peculiar set of geopolitical circumstances which favored in the way that previously had been disfavored the creation of nation states or states anyway with some plausible claim to be nation states. Of course, it's true that if one casts one's eye back to the experiment in nation state building in the interwar years, when after all you might say this whole process and the ideology behind it really gathered pace, one might well have drawn the conclusion that here geopolitics had been profoundly influential. Geopolitics dictated that the great experiment in nation state building in Europe would be a disastrous, catastrophic, and devastating failure when the rival imperialisms of the Nazis and the Soviet Union had their way. Secondly, if one thinks about the notion that the world was in some way naturally divided up into harmonious, bounded units, one might again feel that any uh, proper scrutiny of world history would suggest something extremely different. But firstly, the movements of people around the world were, showed that 
populations were not naturally fixed, but actually dynamically, even dangerously mobile. One thinks only of the original movement of human beings out of Africa, the colonization of China, the movements of Huns and Mongols, the great modern migrations, and of course the great diasporas and migrations of our own day. Secondly, that the world is also deeply influenced and often, as it were, dynamically so, by the growth of empires of religion and the creation of senses of transnational allegiance, which overlapped and challenged any sense of a fixed, bounded, bordered identity and loyalty. Thirdly, there was the impact of pandemics and disease empires, transforming the possibilities of national or ethnic survival, most dramatically, of course, in the Americas and also in Australia, Australasia, as well as other forms of environmental turbulence, which, of course, we are now once again becoming so acutely aware of. Fourthly, the influence of great technological innovations constantly upending cultural hierarchies and creating sometimes alarming proximities between peoples not used, in fact, to encountering each other at close quarters and consequently great alarm as a result. And fifthly, think of the endless series, as it seems, of ideological tsunamis, whether it's in our own more modern era, of liberalism, of capitalism, of Marxism, or of Islamism. In other words, you might conclude, we live in a, and have done always, in a dangerous, turbulent, mobile world in which boundaries and allegiance have been very hard to fix. Now, it seems in retrospect rather extraordinary that the vision of a world of nations should be so much associated with Wilson, with Woodrow T. Wilson. And here I lower my voice because the Woodrow T. Wilson collection is next door. I don't want to be too disrespectful. But you might have thought that of all countries in the world, the country from which Wilson sprang had experienced in its making the impact of seismic population movements and, of course, had grown by a process of violent dispossession. In short, decolonization as leading to a world of nations could only be seen as a natural evolution of world history by ignoring almost everything world history had to teach. So why then was it that the powerful actors of the world of after 1945 should have advanced down this primrose path. And of course, the real reason lay not so much in a fundamental sense of historical change as in a series of powerful geopolitical imperatives. Let's look a bit more closely at that claim. If we start, first of all, with those whom we might describe as the old colonial powers, that's to say, primarily Britain and France with Belgium, the Netherlands, perhaps Spain as well, Portugal. After 1945, it was clear that both individually and collectively, they were too weak to go on sustaining an international order based upon the primacy of an empire. For the British, the motive to engage in a process of political transition, which culminates, you might think, in this form of in, in decolonization, was both negative and positive. On the one hand, the British understood by 1945, or perhaps even a year or two earlier, that they were too weak to go on, but in particular, to sustain their position as the rulers of India. That's an acceptance they come to really, I think, in 1942, a year of catastrophic disaster for the British in the Second World War with the fall of Singapore. And a similar sense of weakness and impotence is what drives them out of Palestine in 1948, had already driven them out of Burma in 1947, 48, and of course drove them out of Egypt in 1954, despite the fact that in Egypt in particular, the British believed that they needed to remain a powerful political and also military presence because the Middle East was still, for even for an empire, you might say, that was beginning to find it harder and harder to sustain itself, the Middle East and Britain's position in it was their great geostrategic asset. But they were too weak to sustain it. But there was also a positive reason for engaging in this political transition. And that was 
to rally the moderates to the cause of a moderate, constructive transition, which would, the British hoped, and I think the French in a similar way, hoped would culminate in regimes that continue to look towards Britain as their great power sponsor, as their guide, as their source of advice, as also a source of expertise and, and probably to some, even some limited extent, of money. And behind this uh, idea of creating moderate successor states, friendly to Britain, uh, sympathetic to British aims in the world, uh, lay, of course, a deeper commitment to sustain Britain's place as a great power, as far as possible, enjoying some at least notional parity with the emergent superpowers. A man who's often regarded as the great architect of British decolonization, especially from the late 1950s, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, was absolutely committed to the idea that Britain as a worldwide, I might say, confederation of states, bonded together by the ideal, ideal of the Commonwealth, would continue to enjoy something like parity with the United States. Now, of course, in the official version of British decolonization, there was a grand, well-thought-out scheme of progressive transfers of power on a kind of clockwork schedule which granted greater and greater power to those uh, colonies as they became, in heavy quotation marks, more politically mature. In reality, something different actually took place. A wag once described the Habsburg monarchy as absolutism mitigated by slovenliness. In this case, British policy, you might say, was pragmatism moderated by panic. Far from discovering, as it were, a clockwork schedule which enabled them to engage in the progressive, careful, carefully tabulated transfers of power, the British actually found themselves engaged in a series of U-turns and Z-bends, attempting to construct federations, then deciding they could not be sustained, as in the West Indies, as in Central Africa, where the Central African Federation, under white management, was designed to be the acceptable face of a continued white presence in a decolonizing world. They attempt a federation in Uganda, change their mind again, and abandon that, and adopt instead a unitary model. In Kenya, there's a particularly interesting case. Macmillan's great henchman, Ian McLeod, often seen as the real technician who carried through the process of decolonization, in East Africa especially, was absolutely determined, under no circumstances whatever, that the successor to British power in Kenya was going to be Jomo Kenyatta. He devised every possible stratagem to ensure this should not happen. But of course, as we know, it was a total failure. In many ways, one might say that behind the grand rhetoric of progressive transfers of power according to the ability of colonial peoples to meet various um, meet various challenges in demonstrating their political maturity. Instead, actually, the only criterion that was really applied with any general um, uh, consistency was to find a viable successor to whom to toss the keys as the British left the building. Now, what about the superpowers? Well, here, it might say, there is a story which is actually not much better, if any at all. The United States, of course, plays a very key role in decolonization. In 1950, it acted to compel the Netherlands, or such is the current scholarly account, compel the Netherlands to give up its attempt to reimpose its power on its East Indian empire, Indonesia, largely because it was calculated in Washington that the regime which would replace them was likely to be anti-communist and therefore highly acceptable to Washington, and therefore it should be put into power before any rivals, especially communist rival, should come along to challenge it. But in the case of Indochina, a reverse course seemed desirable. There, it seemed necessary to sponsor the continuation of French power until that too collapsed under the weight of its own contradictions, and then, of course, to engage in the division of Indochina into two regimes, one at least of which 
would be anti-communist, or certainly to sponsor those on the ground in South Vietnam who looked as if they were willing to play this role. In the Congo, of course, the United States was more than willing, once the dust had settled on the end of Belgian rule, to sponsor, of course, that great hero of freedom fighting, um, Sese Mobutu, who must have compiled one of the largest fortunes of anybody in Africa, Cecil Rhodes notwithstanding. <laughs> as far as the, United, the Soviet Union was concerned, of course, you might say that once the caution or limited caution of Stalin was thrown off by Khrushchev by the mid-1950s, the Soviet Union was willing to support any movement which looked as if it might help to um, undermine the power of the West and to crush any movement which looked as if it might undermine the power of the Soviet Union. Think, of course, of Hungary or Czechoslovakia, 1956 and 1968. Behind all these calculations of Britain, of the United States, and the Soviet Union, of course, lay, above all, a sense of the overwhelming importance of confronting each other in a great Cold War. It's the necessity to find successor regimes which would frustrate the designs and intrigues of the other side, especially from the British and American point of view, of the Soviet side, which really dictates the pace and timing and choices made in terms of successor regimes. And indeed, that competition between, especially now by the 1970s, the superpowers, was intensifying right up to the moment at which Soviet power actually collapsed, or certainly at least into the early 1980s. Now, it's conceivable that a smooth transition to a world of nations could have taken place in an atmosphere of consensus, in which all powerful actors in the world agreed that what was necessary was a fair wind and general support for the creation of new nation states. But that, of course, was not the picture at all. The fact that decolonization took place in a setting largely determined by a Cold War was a fundamental aspect of its trajectory. Now, you might say, perhaps, that all this would have mattered a little bit less had a world of nations really been waiting to be born in 1945. But, of course, that wasn't the case. Think of the two most powerful nationalist movements of the interwar years in Asia, in India and in China. In the interwar years, neither was able to fully assert its claim to govern its territory and to eject the outsider. In the case of the Chinese, of course, because of the invasion of Japanese imperialism, which set in most powerfully after 1937, but was already there from 1931. And of course, after they both acquired uh, full sovereignty, both had to accept, in different measure, partition of their territory. Elsewhere, of course, colonial states, which were the seedbed, or perhaps, the, uh, uh, perhaps that's not quite the best term, but anyway, the seedbeds from which these new sovereign nations were going to be uh, sprung, had, of course, operated in ways which, in many ways, quite unintentionally, made it extremely hard for highly organized uh, new states to actually emerge. Colonial rule in most parts of the world was an exceptionally shallow phenomenon, which made little attempt to mobilize populations beyond the most limited degree required for the raising of a revenue, often a rather limited revenue, and for the maintenance of peace and order. That was emphatically true, of course, in Africa, where colonial states were deeply unambitious. As far as they'd adopted any particular political strategy, it had been to decentralize through the devices of indirect rule, i.e., as far as possible, decentralizing power, devolving power down to differentiated ethnic groups. And indeed, the principle of differentiation between different parts of their territory had been applied with great thoroughness, mainly for pragmatic administrative reasons, though not entirely. Consequently, when colonial rule began to evaporate, it was hardly surprising that a variety of rival successors appeared. And here we turn to our third factor, 
When liberation came over the horizon for former colonial territories, it was not just the case that there were going to be those who were claimants on behalf of the whole nation. A great variety of subnational claimants made their appearance. And these were groups and peoples, ethnic groups sometimes, for whom colonial bargain, the colonial bargain which had maintained imperial rule, overlaid or sustained a whole set of historic injustices between ethnic groups, towards castes, towards religions, and sometimes towards classes. When liberation came along, therefore, in the form of the end of colonial rule, there were not just one, but many groups of people who now sought, as it were, the rectification of these historic injustices. And to take a very small example, in what is now Zimbabwe, there were Ndebele in Western Zimbabwe for whom the end of white rule offered the opportunity, as it were, to reclaim lost lands, to reassert lost dignity, to recover lost power. But there were also people not far away in the Zambezi Valley for whom the immediate oppressor had not been the whites, but the Ndebele themselves. They now wanted liberation from what they saw as being Ndebele domination in which the whites had been, for their own reasons, complicit. Fourthly, of course, it was often the case that although it had been possible to construct temporary coalitions against imperial rule, colonial rule, largely because colonial rule had, in the, in, in the post immediate post-war years, come to seem more and more oppressive, for a variety of reasons we can discuss later, if you would like, those temporary coalitions rapidly disintegrated once it became a question not so much of evicting foreign rule, but as deciding how the fruits of independence should be shared out between different groups, and even perhaps between different individuals. And then fifthly, there is a real problem, perhaps, which too little attention has been given. All these ex-colonial states were encouraged to try and advance themselves towards what was regarded in the West as a real, ideal form of nation state. The kind of nation state which had appeared, especially in Northwest Europe. Bounded territories, organized governments, strong senses of cultural and ethnic identity, close allegiance, etc. Yet that view ignored the fact that those nation states in Western Europe had come about through very, very unusual means. Many of you will know that marvelous aphorism by Charles Tilly. The state makes war, and war makes the state. In other words, that it had been the ways in which these states had organized themselves for their ferocious rivalries and conflicts within the cockpit of Europe, which had so often given them both the motivation and the means to create true or something closer to a sense of true national identity, to mobilize their populations, to ensure and to accentuate their control over their bounded territories. It had been the peculiar circumstances of frequent, if not constant, warfare in Europe, which actually permitted this process to be carried through to the level it had reached by the 20th century. But that was the one thing which ex-colonial states were not able to do. Indeed, were likely to be prevented from doing, even had they wished to do it. State making by war, the thing which had made Western European nation states, was not an option. And finally, you might say, it's of course worth noticing that although these kinds of difficulties and perhaps failures, although failures you might think that were in many ways uh, either inevitable or certainly extremely pardonable. Many of these failures of nation building and state building were largely hidden in the Cold War period because during that period, both sides, both sides, East and West, were so willing to sponsor and to subsidize the power of those actually who controlled the reins of the state by whatever means, usually, of course, through the subsidization of increasing militarism throughout the ex-colonial world. 
I come now, and you may say not before time, to my last theme. I'm very conscious that uh, there needs to be plenty of time, not only for questions, which may indeed be very short, but of course for the consumption of food and drink. <laughs> what was the impact of globalization on this decolonized world? Globalization, of course, can be thought of as a form of double revolution. On the one hand, a massive hike in the scale of global economic integration, the flows especially of money as well as of goods around the world. But a double revolution because this was in many ways made possible by the defeat of the Soviet Union by the mid and late 1980s and therefore the opening up of the hitherto closed Eastern Bloc to international trade and to the kinds of flows I've just mentioned. This had two consequences, which were likely to affect the ex-colonial world very deeply. Firstly, it relieved the West of the need to go on propping up regimes which it no longer particularly liked the look of, even if they were the regimes which had maintained even if only fitfully, the administrative and political unity of ex-colonial states. But secondly, it permitted the West to enforce a neoliberal economic regime, often described as structural readjustment. Now, the results of this, you might say, resemble perhaps a survival of the fittest, that term associated with an obscure biologist whose name I forget. Sometimes it was the case that new elites were able to consolidate power, as for example in Malaysia, because the rewards of engaging in international trade created the means for building more powerful and centralized states. Economic success, in that sense, played the part, perhaps, of war in Tilly's formulation. But others fell apart a structural readjustment destroyed the capacities of the center to disperse patronage and maintain the power of the capital over its remoter provinces. Thirdly, in many cases, neoliberal economics made the control of resources even more critical and tended perhaps on occasions, you know, if not on many occasions, to accelerate, as it were, the tendency towards cronyism and corruption. Fourthly, and very critically, what you might call the NGO revolution also had a dramatic impact on the power of those states who were perhaps least able to resist, as it were, the impact of the NGO presence. They were most likely to be, indeed, in states where state power was underdeveloped or, in certain respects, defective. The presence of NGOs inserting international influence, bypassing the structures of the existing government, uh, connecting directly with communities, offering the most talented people within a society the opportunity to work at a much higher rate of pay usually for them rather than for their own government. This, this NGO revolution was undoubtedly propelled by powerfully idealistic motives but its impact upon the capacity of ex-colonial states to build their own structures and assert effective rule is something perhaps which requires much more scrutiny than has been so far given to it. Altogether, you might say, our harsh experience of nation building over the last 25 or 30 years has suggested how deeply flawed have been most academic theories of that nation building process which mostly turned out to be quite pitifully myopic. And uh, there's expertise in the room, perhaps, which uh, may uh, uh, bring this up in, in, in discussion in a minute, but one might well think that uh, Afghanistan, perhaps, represents one of the most striking cases of the difficulty of nation building on whatever model the academics might invent. So, finally, what verdict can we reach? We might be inclined to say, as a wag said about the French Revolution, was it a success? Well, after 200 years, it's rather too soon to tell. 
even more so perhaps of decolonization after a mere 50 years. Perhaps one lesson we should draw is that our notion of decolonization does need a considerable expansion from its political limits. Decolonization was not just the uh, granting of sovereignty to large numbers of new states. Well, that, of course, was a key component of it. It was the unraveling of a Europe-centered global imperial order in a whole number of other ways. It was a transformation, in particular, of international norms about the rights, particularly, of interference in other sovereign states, which in the 19th century or in the imperial era had been, you might say, uh, largely ignored by those powerful enough uh, to ignore them. And the extent to which that new norm has been entrenched is reflected, of course, in the intense and ferocious debate, not least in this country, about the legitimacy of intervention, for example, particularly in Iraq. But thirdly, decolonization has also meant, as it were, the opportunity or the encouragement to achieve economic autonomy. In other words, a transformation from the old status of being dependence upon the imperial and also industrial and capital giving power, escape from that into a wider economic freedom. And to some extent, one might say that globalization for many ex-colonial territories has indeed at last performed that function. It's no longer possible to see the world uh, in remotely like it was in the uh, old imperial era as divided into two great classes of the economically powerful and the economically impotent. Fourthly, of course, decolonization also upended a cultural hierarchy which had validated, in particular, Northwest European ways of doing things and had treated most other cultures and civilizations as being perhaps pretty and exotic, but in the words of a very influential writer of the late 19th century, socially uh, inefficient. It created also the opportunity to discover new notions of identity on a vast scale. Anybody visiting any library these days will be struck by the profusion of volumes in which the assertion or reassertion of identity is a major theme. And lastly, of course, decolonization turned out to be the prelude to an enormous demographic upheaval, the consequences of which we have yet still to live through. Viewed like this, it seems to me, decolonization actually eludes any pedantic category of success or failure. Instead, we should better see it as a vast, sprawling fact of life, a huge work in progress with which our world must come to terms. Thank you very much. I'm sure Dr. Darwin will be glad to respond to questions. Oh, yes. 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 And as you can see, I'm part of the decolonization jetson. Um, I've worked for four. Uh, I'm Mohammed Kassim, and I'm a retired world banker, but don't hold that against me. Uh, I, I have uh, worked in about 40 countries, uh, usually in the uh, rural areas. And I also will go there, not as an economist, but as a student of society. Why are these countries not moving? What is it? Why are there so many wars? And sometime ago, it dawned on me that the legacy of the empire was not nations. It was a whole bunch of uh, conceits. That there are very, very few nations. The, the empires are drawn like this. I mean, three Brits and a Russian drew the, what is called Afghanistan, and two Brits, Af Pakistan. I mean, that does not make a nation. And so what you have then, are, as you mentioned, there are these tensions as the colonial power went, that the ethnic groups which were hostile settled scores. And you see that in uh, Kenya, you see that in now Ivory Coast, any number, especially Africa. And uh, if you take Sudan, I flew over Sudan in 55, and Juba was in flames, three months after independence. 
I'm old. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, this is a country as big as the EU. What, two and a half million square kilometers? Well, if the, e the civilized Europeans couldn't settle it without slaughtering each other, why do you expect the 200 ethnic groups in the Sudan to behave themselves? So I'd like to have you ex extend on that, which is the issue of creating nations out of the colonization process, and why maybe we've got fragile states galore and they'll be collapsing. I, I didn't catch the last Why one. all these fragile states that have come out will probably be collapsing. That's my theory. Right, right. right. Well, I mean, if I had the answer to that, I'm sure I'd be uh, uh, a great deal wealthier and, uh, yeah. But I think the, the, uh, the only thing one has to say is this, that I think the, uh, it's perfectly true, as you say, that not everywhere, but in, in, in many cases, in many cases, and I suppose the most numerous cases are, as we found in Africa, uh, constructing a nation state, yes, is an extraordinarily difficult task. Now, is there any alternative? That, I think, is the dilemma. There isn't actually an alternative to which the international community really would like to uh, give any credence to. Well, I think what's true to say is that one of the difficulties that is faced by any successor state, whether it's Sudan or anywhere else, is that now those sorts of processes of, let's call it by the anodyne term, integration, which in the past took place, uh, you might say, to some extent in private, um, by the powerful elements within a particular territory asserting their control, dominating uh, those groups that were recalcitrant or apparently unwilling to accept command from the center. This could be done, these forms of um, harassment and domination could be done without very much scrutiny from anybody, and certainly nobody in a position to interfere with what you were doing. The problem for many states in the world now, uh, we might say, of course there must be scrutiny. Human rights matter. You can't allow a state like the Sudan to oppress people within its territory. But if it doesn't oppress them, and if it permits international supervision to intervene in the way in which its affairs are conducted, then it remains in a kind of political stasis in which it's unable to actually reach any resolution between those different groups within its territory. So I think in some ways, and of course, some states have managed to do this out of the eye of the world, and some have managed to do it by more subtle means, partly because, perhaps, they've been blessed with the resources to do it. Money is a great lubricator in these things. Uh, partly, perhaps, because the ethnic divisions and differences have been more amenable to some form of arrangement or settlement. But where they really aren't amenable in that way, and where you are compelled to conduct your state-building activities in the full glare of publicity, uh, and with the constant uh, threat, as it seems to be such governments, of external intervention, it's very hard to see how you can actually move forward, if that's the right term to use. So I don't think there's any very good news on that front. Howdy, I'm... Is this on, is thing on? Okay, it is. All right, howdy, I'm Chris Ring. I am an intern with uh, Congressman Duncan Hunter's office. I'm a student at uh, George Washington University. Um, my question for you is, Professor Darwin, is would you consider Rhodesia to be the ultimate failure in decolonization? Because when it was finally decolonized in 1980, it was the wealthiest economy in Africa. It had the, um, as Ian Smith wrote in his memoirs, the happiest black faces in the continent. And it ha <laughs> oh, that, that's his own words. Um, and he described all this infrastructure and how basically it was of a strong um, e equivalent almost to a first world e economy and how it's completely collapsed into being the trash pit of the world essentially. Would you consider that to be a, the greatest failure and how that could be, and how could the lesson of the collapse of um, now Zimbabwe to be 
um, lessons for future um, developments in uh, the uh, former decolonized world. Thank you. Well, I think there are two interesting things about, uh, about the Zimbabwe case. I mean, I think, uh, unfortunately, the competition to be the worst uh, example of what happens <laughs> is, is, ra is rather a hot one. So I don't know whether you really necessarily can award the prize to Zimbabwe. But what the Zimbabwe case does show is that one of the theories about who is likely to perform best coming out of um, colonial rule has, in this case, been disproved, because there was an assumption that those territories which had had uh, an elaborate infrastructure built up by a substantial, in this case, white population, a uh, population of uh, you know, uh, several hundred thousand, yeah, um, that this would enable an incoming state to have a very substantial, you might say, inheritance or endowment to build upon, and that uh, where they, I might say, rationally came to terms with the uh, the, the, those who remain behind from this uh, population of settlers, who usually commanded very significant economic resources, that this would actually be to the general benefit of the population. Now, why the Zimbabwe case turned so sour? Because that was the assumption made uh, on independence in 1980, that Mugabe would act, as it were, quote, rationally. He would deploy this infrastructure to make Zimbabwe a very successful commercial economy, and he would acknowledge the value, even if he didn't like them, of the settlers as contributors to the commercial. Why didn't he do that? Well, to some extent, you might say, the other side of the coin in the case of Zimbabwe was that the process of building a guerrilla force, a, 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 a liberation army, as perhaps it would be termed by those that took part in it, uh, to overthrow white rule, was a process which first of all, created a great deal of, uh, of capacity of force. And secondly, of course, it created a very widespread sense of entitlement. And that is something which those who inherited a colonial state peaceably did not face in the same way. If you didn't have a great guerrilla army to whom you owed your power, then you didn't have to give away so many rewards. Whereas Mugabe found himself in a position, I think, in which the um, demands of those who had a powerful sense of entitlement ultimately could not be ignored, not least in the situation in which he also, of course, uh, confronted ethnic division between um, the Shona and Mashona, with whom, from whom he uh, derived most of his political base on the one hand, and the Ndebele in the west of the country on the other. So you actually have a cross-cutting of two very destabilizing phenomena. On the one hand, entitlement. On the other, the need to consolidate his ethnic base against the challenge posed, especially by Ndebele and Ndebele politicians. Well, did you see, after, did you see right after independence uh, how um, Mugabe went after the Matabeles and Fonsi um, III, the Chimarenga? The famous, yes, indeed, indeed, exactly, exactly. And how he, um, yeah. Indeed, yeah, I mean, for Mugabe, exactly, Mugabe, no, whether he exaggerated or not, he certainly believed that his regime was by no means safe, sound, and secure. So I think that's, I mean, if you were asking how does one explain this uh, tragedy of Zimbabwe, I think those two elements seem to me to be you know, amongst the most powerful and determinative of, the, of this rather very sad outcome. So yeah. the outcome was a better yeah. than right? I think, well, I think, well, perhaps, yes, indeed, yeah. Another question. Uh, it seems to me that the whole notion of human rights developed, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, uh, or came, became very strong at the same time that decolonization was happening, that it's identified with the formation of the UN. Um, and I'm guessing that the NGO movement maybe is a element of that, a, a, a implementation of a sort of philosophical notion um, can you say something about the relationship to those two and, and why um, the, the notion that you have to do your uh, evil in secret? Because for generations, you just 
cut people's heads off in the middle of the street and people thought it was normal. So how did this notion of human rights, how does that intersect with decolonization? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, it's what is interesting is that um, if you look at the United Nations Charter, this is the point made, of course, by Mark Mazower in that, I think, splendid recent book of his, No Enchanted Palace. If you look at the United Nations Charter compared with the Covenant of the League of Nations, 1919, whereas the League Covenant in 1919 has a great deal about minorities and much of the, as it were, the effort uh, of international organization in the interwar years is put into this question of how you safeguard minorities. This becomes a, uh, becomes a very, very powerful uh, rhetorical question. It influences the way the British talk about, for example, their rule in India. They're talking about a great deal of stuff about minorities in that. Compare that with the United Nations Charter, and it really is quite uninterested in minorities. And indeed, the whole question of catering or protecting minorities was not something which appealed very much to those who contemplated uh, the building of new sovereign states out of the uh, detritus of empire. Because, of course, they saw that, especially if it was going to be policed by the international community as empire by the back door. In other words, that the old imperial powers or the new imperial powers would intervene under the guise of protecting minorities uh, in order to restore the political authority which they'd given away with one hand they were now going to take back with the other. Now, what I think you're absolutely right about is that at some point rather after, as it were, the onset of decolonization, this notion of the universality of human rights does begin to take off. Of course, you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights going back to the 1940s, you have the European uh, notions of you know, civil rights as well, which develop and get in, in institutionalized uh, in the 40s and 50s. But uh, you can see that this is only really rather a kind of shadow on the horizon right through the 1950s into the early 60s. If you look at the way in which lawyers, especially those lawyers especially concerned with the building of new states, uh, the lawyers attached to the colonial office in London or other people who operate in this, not necessarily under government employer, but it, within this sort of world, their notion of what constitutes human rights is really pretty underdeveloped, and there's very little sense of how you're actually going to apply it properly. So it's something which really begins sometime in, perhaps even in the later 1960s, uh, and uh, begins to take off, and maybe not unconnected with, movements, of course, in this country, uh, which are in many ways set a kind of standard for, and, and offer a method for how human rights can be promoted through the idea of civil rights, of course. I think the two sort of merge into each other. So it's actually a, a development which occurs rather after decolonization really gets going. And in some ways, as I suggested in my talk, there is a sort of implicit conflict between the pursuit of human rights by outside, as it were, bodies and agencies on the one hand, and you might say the project of decolonization on the other. And it's not one which it's possible to see any easy way of resolving. Let's take two more questions, and then we will carry on the conversation over uh, the last line. Yes. Hi, I'm Kimberly Moxley from the University of Georgia, and um, I was just wondering about the um, how resources affect um, development of sovereignty and decolonized nations. Specifically, resources can be sort of a blessing because they can bring economic um, economic stimulus to a country, but um, when countries are trying to develop their own sense of sovereignty, their own sense of self and power, um, they not only have to deal with uh, Western countries trying to come in to help develop resources to fill their own needs, but they also have to deal with corporations coming in and putting out their own branches of control. Um, I guess we've most famously seen this with blood diamonds um, and corporations like that. So how do you think decolonized states can balance this sort of need for economic inclusion in the global market and a need to develop their own sovereignty? So the answer is with difficulty. Um, the, uh, as you say, I mean, I, very often it depends upon the particular strategic situation of, of, uh, of, of a given country. Some countries have been able to assert uh, very effectively state sovereignty over their resources uh, and to compel outsiders uh, to pay fairly heavily for the privilege of um, exploiting those resources. 
Sometimes, of course, that payment does not flow necessarily into the state coffers. Uh, it may flow into other people's purses. Um, but certainly, it's, uh, I think one of the characteristics of even the early decolonization period was the way in which um, international business found it necessary to make, to cut a deal with the successor regimes in order to, as it were, insert themselves into uh, these states. And in many ways found it not that difficult, so often because, for all the rather nefarious reasons that we know about, it was often quite easy to persuade somebody somewhere in that successor regime to make life easy for you. The real challenge, of course, is for a, a former colonial territory, a decolonized country, uh, to maximize the domestic benefit of engaging in this globalizing uh, economy of, of our own time without losing control over its resources or seeing them effectively annexed by some multinational corporation who, uh, if left unconstrained, have very little incentive to, as it were, return very much to that country, whether it's in the form of training, or whether it's in the form of uh, building infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Now, whether as a state you're able to make a good deal with a, such a corporation and preserve your control does seem to be so often to depend upon all sorts of variables, one of which is your own size, your own wealth, the extent to which you yourself deploy significant economic expertise, significant managerial expertise to actually hold such corporations to account rather than be run rings round by, by them. Uh, and the other, of course, is that uh, cyclical factor, which is uh, so variable, whether the commodity which you are, happen to be strong in commands a very high price in the world of today. It might be oil, but as we know, the price of oil, as everything else, the price of copper, all these commodities go up and down. Many of them are very up at the moment for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but uh, I think, so there's no one rule, it seems to me, uh, and there are all sorts of complexities and difficulties about carrying this off. That is, I suppose, the story of the, of, of the, of the general problem of, the, of economic development in such places. Our last question. James saying, uh, you spoke about how the uh, how history had defeated the uh, expectations of the decolonizers and the decolonized. Are there any examples where, in fact, uh, the expectations were met reasonably well? Well, I suggested, I think, that, I mean, that, uh, uh, of course, in the case of the South Asian subcontinent, I mean, uh, decolonization engulfed it in a vast human tragedy. Uh, but I would think that uh, although there are various qualifications to be made, that most observers would agree that uh, if there's one ex-colonial territory which has been able to uh, build institutions which actually um, empower its populations to a considerable extent, uh, preserve the rule of law, uh, and create, as it were, um, something like, as it were, a, um, uh, an environment in which individual merit and talent can find its level, then probably India would be seen as, 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 as meeting many of those criteria. And we all know there are an enormous number of qualifications to be made about that, but so there are everybody, and after all, um, we mustn't, I think, behave as or talk as though it's the case that uh, countries of the former imperial world somehow <laughs> have an unblemished record in all these respects either. Um, I come from a country which is rather good at scandals, particularly one at the moment. <laughs> we want to continue the discussion over a glass of wine, but let's go back. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.